Hello, friend. Hello. And welcome to Broadcast Original Series 2.19 with Peter and Amory. Ah, yes. Last time we covered Hobsession. For men. Uh, indeed, and we heard back from Martin Thompson. Some quality Shatting in this one. Shatner going full Shatner with all the pauses. Ground zero for Shatner impressions, he says. <laughs> yeah, there were moments, definitely moments. And we had do from Drew. The Galileo 7 is another episode where they are against the clock delivering medicines. They are. Oh, yeah. We knew there was no one, we couldn't think yeah. what it was. Thank you. Thank you. But on to the the immunity syndrome. Uh, It's written by Robert Sabaroff, who also wrote the Dire Season 1 Next Generation episode, Home Soil. Oh. Yes, and contributed the story for Conspiracy later in the season. Well, Conspiracy's good. Not bad, yeah. And directed by... Pevster. His 14th and last episode of Star Trek. (laughs) The reason he gave for leaving was the behaviour of the regular actors, which he felt deteriorated when Gene L. Coon left the series. Aboo! No more Pepster. Captain's log, stardate 4308.8. The intrepid, it just died. And the 400 Vulcans aboard, all dead. The stars are gone. According to the life monitors, we're dying. We're all dying. I cannot say what it is, Captain, but I would say it has found us. Grant me my own kind of dignity. How can I grant you what I don't understand? Contact in six seconds. Spark, come in. Come in. Contact lost, sir. Power levels are dead, sir. You may have just written our epitaph, Mrs. Young. Yeah, so you've got Kirk, and is he doing a captain's log? He's got his. I thought they always did them when they were like on their own, and he's no, there, no. he's just pressing the button on the chair and sort of half he's talking to the at the same time. Yeah. Anyway, he's, they're approaching Star. Base six for some shore leave because they're all really tired. He says he's he's ogling the yeoman when he says it. Yeah, it's horrible. And then um, Spock is suddenly in pain to an extent that you know his his crewmates turn around and like you know what's up? And he says that um, the intrepid just died with the loss of four hundred Vulcan crew. Yeah. So a we we've got a Starfleet ship staffed by Vulcans, which will come up, come up again in Deep Space Nine. And also, weirdly, Vulcans are now psychically in touch with one another across deep space. Hmm. Not sure that will come up again. No, I don't know if it does. I'm pretty sure it doesn't. (laughs) Okay. Because it reminded me a bit of... In Star Wars. Yes, it's very Star Wars. Uh, But the difference is that Obi-Wan Kenobi knew the Force. Spot doesn't. (laughs) No, but rather than Star Trek, it made me think more Mm -hmm. of Star Wars. You know what I mean? That sort of... What is it, a million? What is it? As if millions of Vulcans suddenly cried out in terror and was suddenly silent. Yes! Yeah. Yes. Anyway, he gets, Spock gets ordered to sick bay and he's like, I'm right. And they're like, yeah, but you still need to go to sick bay, which is fair enough because they've all seen him react. And then they get um, sort of a crackly channel. They get um, Starfleet ordering them to a rescue mission to look at, in Sector Gamma 7A to look not just because they've lost contact with the Intrepid, they've lost contact with the whole system. So that's millions of inhabitants. Mm-hmm. And that's your teaser. Then after the teaser, in sick bay, Spock says that um, the Vulcans don't understand why they died. And then there's a, a conversation about how humans like get really upset about the death of one person, but not at the, the death of many and certainly not 400 Vulcans and then Spock's like you know is there not there, there's so little room in your heart McCoy it's just like oh yeah that seems a bit harsh really it's true though when loads of people die it's yeah. like we can't process it yeah it doesn't make us as emotional as when one person or maybe two die there's, it's like there's a a point beyond which we just can't process that level of pain so we don't mm-hmm Ahura's um, trying to sort of get a message but can't filter out the distortion. There's indications of turbulence ahead and then they can see a sort of black shape hole-ish in space. Yeah, now, we haven't done this in a very long while, but... And now it's time for... Who's at the... Gosh. 
It's Kyle. It is, Mr. Kyle. And did you notice anything different about Mr. Kyle? He's wearing yellow. That's it. Yes, he's changed division. Oh. Uh, which, of course, you know, is, happens in mm. a Trek series. That's not a problem. And he'll have transferred to Services Blue by Rafa Khan. So he's, he's served in all three divisions by then. But anyway. As long as he's not demoted from the Premier League or something, we're all right. No. To the first division or the second. Oh, I see what you did there. Okay. I mean, I wish you hadn't, but I see what you did there. <laughs> but, you know, the fact that they talk about the dark zone just made me think of Lex. Yes, my heavens, oh dear. There's a loud noise, which Uhura initially thinks is the telemetry probe, and then, uh, but there's no signal, and then it makes... Uhura is very dizzy, and then you find out that half the people on the ship almost fainted. Uhura says she's OK. There's no information on the phenomenon. Phenomenon. And Kirk just keeps getting crosser and crosser with everybody not having Yeah, it's a bit unfortunate. It comes right on the back of Obsession where he was pretty grumpy as well. (laughs) Mind you, I suppose the idea is that they were supposed to be going to Shoreleigh because they're all really tired. Yeah, it's understandable, isn't it? Yes, I I don't have a problem with it here in a way that it it seemed a little bit artificial in Obsession, but anyway. And so what he says to Spock is, okay, can you tell me what it's not? And it's not a nebula. It might be some form of energy. Did it kill the intrepid, you know? That's almost certainly the the cause of their deaths. And they're going to try and attempt to probe to gain further information. The deflectors are at full power and then the noise comes again and it's not coming from comms. Um, and then the stars are gone. Dog and dark. And then even more people are starting to faint. McCoy and a nurse, but it's not Chapel, come onto the bridge to give the bridge crew a shot. But, I like that. Cause, yeah. yeah, presumably Chapel's involved because we're told there are loads of people yeah. in... Sick bays. And so. you, at one point you see a queue of people outside yeah, trying yeah. to get stickers. And it's not like we don't see Chapel later on. Yeah. So that's, that's quite good. That's making it look like there's a bigger staff there, as, yeah. as there should be. We see a red shirt drop and get put back in his chair. And this is described as being in the middle of a creeping paralysis. The sound is the turbulence of crossing a boundary. And Kirk's like, from what to what? And McCoy's like, from where we were to where we are. It's like, yeah, that's not an awful lot of help. But they've entered a, a, a zone of um, basically incompatible energy. Um, McCoy recommends survival and leaving, but then Kirk gives mm. the ship's wide order, say it's their mission to investigate. And then, um, yeah, I, I personally I'm with McCoy on that yeah. one, but there you go. And McCoy says they're all dying. Well, the thing is, I know they don't know this now, but that thing, it turned out, was about to reproduce. And so actually, if they hadn't investigated... Then... Yes, it would have gone worse than But they did, didn't know that at the time. No. So then they discover that going backwards makes them go forwards or forwards makes them go back. So I forget, forget. Anyway, it's all <laughs> topsy-turvy. Um, the patients are beginning to stabilise. And then uh, although the whole backwards-forwards things works, they're still their energy is still being really drained. So then there is a negative energy field, but it's that isn't the source of the energy drain. And then a discussion about, you know, do we need to use our, our power to go somewhere to try and escape or should we have, you know, more power to the shields? And you get Spock going that shields would only prolong the, in- the inevitable wait for death. And you're like, you're a cheery soul, uh, aren't you? Happy talky talking, happy talk. And then Spock says, you know, the Intrepid would have, done all of th- would have done all of these things. But then it's like, well, actually, would they have done? Because... They were Vulcans. Then you find out that no, Vul- no Vulcan can conceive of a conqueror. This just hasn't been one in living memory. And he says that when they all died, he felt death, but what they felt was astonishment. So I'm guessing what he's picking up is just the extreme amount of emotion from so many Vulcans at the same time. Yeah, it does rather stretch credulity that that can somehow travel through space psychically and be picked up by him, though, doesn't it? I don't know. <laughs> it's it's again. Sometimes they do sort of creep towards Vulcans being kind of magical and yeah. <laughs> and then uh, this idea of having this big thrust, it doesn't work. But then Spock says it has found us. Ba ba ba! It being a giant pinky blob thing. It's a space amoeba. Space amoeba. Yeah, it's an eleven thousand mile long amoeba. Now. You know what I'm going to say here, don't you? They don't make them like they used to, those guys. And I can't get used to the way that it is today. All right, I'm going to be really predictable, I'm afraid, and say, yes, the original version is better than the remastered version. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, it has to be said with the original version... 
when we've got the Enterprise and the shuttle overlaid onto the Space Amoeba, that's not so great. And there are lots of matte lines, and yeah, that looks a bit ropey. But the actual Space Amoeba itself, as a practical effect, far, far better than the CG rendition. Hey who? <laughs> We've got, of course, our second giant space gribbly of the series, following on from the Doomsday Machine, and this one is far better realised. Yeah. Spock surmises it lives on the energy from starships, and the only reason they're alive is because it already feasted on the Intrepid. It's just full up, it's not hungry yet. Yeah. McCoy suggests sending a shuttle over to stu- closer to study it, as their probes have not been 100% successful. Kirk won't let his dot go. Spot wants to go instead, but of course Kirk wants it to be him, despite the fact that he isn't a science specialist. But at least he gets talked out of it. Yeah. So, fair dues, okay. There's a pointless recap scene where Kirk reviews in a blog entry... Blog entry, yeah, because he was blogging back in the <laughs> 60s. <gasps> Evans. A log entry, what we've learned already, and his dilemma as to which of his friends to send, which is a bit pointless padding, but there we are. We get another pointless update on the state of the ship from Scotty. Uh, again, all stuff we already knew. And then Kirk announces he's sending Spock, which is probably the correct mm. choice, I think. Yeah. McCoy gets all jelly, and Spock asks the Doctor to wish him luck, which he does after Spock has left, which is very in character. Yeah. They've changed the shuttle set. Have you noticed? No. Ah, well, they've made a sort of separate flight cabin with a big instrument panel and the rest of it, which is where the passengers were sit before. We don't really see, but there's like a, a grating bit at one point. And quite nice to do a shot through it, looking at Spock in the front. He talks about penetrating the organism. For now. <laughs> He's running out of energy as he makes contact and heads to the nucleus and discovers the amoeba is about to reproduce. We get some cool shots looking through the shuttle's windows. They lose contact with Spock, but then he lets them know he's alive by kicking the amoeba in the side or something, apparently. It's not the clearest bit of dialogue from Kirk, that bit. He hails to tell them it's possible to destroy it from within. And for the second time, they make out Spock is going to die with a tell Dr. McCoy he should have wished me luck. There's really no tension, as you know, the first officer will survive. Yeah, did they then know? That's yes, the first... I'm sure they did. Okay. <laughs> he was the most popular character. Some people preferred him to Kirk, so they weren't going to get I rid do. of him. McCoy is clearly upset that his frenemy has seemingly carked it and compares the amoeba to a disease invading their galaxy. Kurt realises they can be antibodies, or he pronounces it very weirdly. He does. Attacking the beastie using antimatter. Again. Wasn't that the solution in the last episode as well? They used antimatter. They used antimatter. If in doubt. (laughs) It's their equivalent. I've got really bad acne. Use antimatter. (laughs) It's their equivalent of reverse the polarity of the neutral. It is really, isn't it? As they race into the amoeba, there's some terrible effects work in the remastered version with the flimsiest rendered shots of the Enterprise yet seemingly flying through a lava lamp. Although, again, to be fair, in the original version, they're not the effects aren't great at this point either, so you can't win, I'm afraid. Kirk nicely explains why they can't just send a probe in from a distance with the antimatter as the eddies would send it off target. Spock records a log, expecting it to be his last. Both he and Kirk back on the Enterprise record their commendations for their crewmates, which is sweet. Yeah. Although I'm sure Kirk's done this so many times now that they must be commendated up to the wazoo, but anyway. They launch their probe, which if they were going to show something extra on the special edition would have been a good thing to show, but they don't. (laughs) They detect Spock's shuttle, and there's a nice bit where he tells them not to rescue him, but McCoy tells him to put up and shut up. (laughs) Despite their power levels reaching zero, they escape when the antimatter hits, wiping out the amoeba. And our episode ends with Kirk ogling another female crew member. Oh, oh nice. Wow. But Kirk isn't a Lechi Lafario at all. Oh, no, not all. Sorry. But, you know, really he is. (laughs) Arguably, this is a bottle show because it's all set on the Enterprise, although I guess the effects that they've used was quite expensive, so that would have been where the budget went. Uh, There's a lot of bridge shaky cam, it has to be said. (laughs) It just reminded me of those things that people have done where they've stabilised the camera, so it it makes the crew look ridiculous, but there we are. Classic or toss, my dear, what do we think? I think I like it more than I dislike it. Uh Uh-huh. I'm not sure it's a classic though. It's not sure that I'd where one where I'd say to somebody, "Oh, you must watch the Space Amoeba episode." Do you yeah. know what I mean? I don't. So I would say it's between. I don't think it's a classic, but I mm. wouldn't say it's toss either. No, I think it's more classic than toss. But it, you're, you're right. There's nothing particularly exciting or memorable about it. I don't. No. Think. I certainly wouldn't list it in my top ten episodes or anything like that. So. No. But it's okay. It's all right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, there's nothing offensive here Apart beyond from Kirk the, Ogle yeah. and the bloody women. Size. <laughs> and we've heard from Jeff, who writes, 
I love this one. Such a ridiculous big concept. There's a good space mystery and some genuine dread leading up to the big revelation. There's also a lot of Spock and McCoy banter, but it feels Hmm. weirdly petty and antagonistic in this one. It does seem a little too mean. Yeah. (laughs) But then that's kind of made up for as a delight when McCoy realises that Spock's alive. And Jeff says it might not quite make my top 10, but top 15 for sure. Oh, right. Okay. Quantifying it with that. Excellent. Boss has this to say, this was a dramatic episode and it made a nice change to have one set entirely on the Enterprise. There was no beaming down to a previously used location, weird costumes or red shirts buying it in increasingly stupid ways. Mm. Yeah, no crappy sets either for that matter. While it was similar in plot to the Doomsday Machine, there were enough new ideas to make it stand out on its own. It starts with Spock having an Obi-Wan moment, there you go, by feeling the deaths of the Vulcan crew. Uh, this led to a good scene with him and McCoy, these interactions being a highlight of the episode. I also like the scenes with Kirk, especially when he had to choose which of his friends to send on what was most likely a suicide mission. Mm. Yeah, that, I suppose that was good. I mean, I could have done without him repeating the plot that we already knew at that point, but I guess they'd probably just come out of an advert break at that point. And also, I think it would make sense in his own mind he'd go through stuff in terms of listing the pros and the cons. Mm-hmm. I do wish that Scotty would have had more to do than just give out power readings, though. Everybody did get a few lines, at least, except for Sulu, who was not there again. Yeah. Yes. When they finally reached the life form at the centre of the anomaly, it was an interesting design. And I like the idea of it being a giant space amoeba. I don't know if it was, I was watching a CGI'd version, but I like the colours on it, and it was a step up from the glass cl- gas cloud in Obsession. That's true enough, mm. yes. I mean, the way you can spot the CGI version is that the Enterprise looks crap, if it's a <laughs> CGI version, to be honest. <laughs> I had to snigger at Spock's line about the area around the penetration being sensitive <laughs> as he was sticking his probe in. For not. I'm sure your minds went to the same place. Yes, yes, they did. It was a disappointment that for the second episode in a row, the solution was to blow it up with antimatter. Oh, yes. Overall, I enjoyed the episode as it was character-based and it reminded me of how the crew are in the films that I watched as a kid. Uh-huh. There we are. Yep. Thank you. What did Sampo and Yona make of this? Hello. Hello. So we just watched the immunity syndrome. What happened in it? Lots of penetration <laughs> and going through through membranes and leaving antimatter at the center and, <laughs> and the, then the membrane burst. I don't think they asked permission to do that. No. This is a second episode in a row when they come across something, some big powerful being and just think how to destroy it. Mm. Yeah, but uh, to be fair, it appeared as if it was going to destroy the whole galaxy. So I mean, the, uh, may, maybe this mm-hmm. time it was a bit more sort of hey, okay. And they at least did study it as well. So I mean, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I do find it funny that on any random week they can bump into a sort of apocalyptic, almost Cthulhu-like <laughs> thing that could just destroy the galaxy. They handle it and then they go on and continue the what they were doing, like nothing happened. It's almost like, it's charming, I guess that's the word. Yeah, it's a good word. Yes. Yes. But yeah, I have to admit that even though this was an episode where an entire uh-huh. <laughs> galaxy was destroyed and 400 Vulcans, which seemed to be yeah, the bigger I deal. I <laughs> turned my back and made a sandwich and suddenly mm-hmm. 400 Vulcans had died. Yeah, well, Spock went all Obi-Wan, like he felt a disturbance in the force. <laughs> I mean, it was... But um, I, I thought it was a nice thing to speculate that if humans would feel other humans' death, we'd be a whole lot less bloodthirsty. That's a very good thought and most likely true. Hmm. But yeah, like, you alluded to earlier it was a bit slow and repetitive i mean last week kirk was sick now everyone was sick (laughs) everyone's just sweaty and slow i mean he (laughs) yeah it it turned out to be a pandemic yeah clearly (laughs) and i mean they sit in one meeting discussing the things and then kirk makes a log entry talking about exactly the same things that they just talked about in the last scene i mean for an episode for an episode where there's a galaxy level threat, it was a <laughs> bit 
boring and, and think about the threats we are under right now but we just don't know like i said in star trek it can happen almost every week and indeed is, is it really so that they are they are commissioned not to stay alive <laughs> that was a i mean if it was supposed to be an inspiring speech i don't think it was very good <laughs> Our orders aren't to stay alive, they're to explore, damn it, and that's what we'll do, <laughs> even if it means flying into into a huge space <laughs> hole, <laughs> penetrating it and its membranes. <laughs> I, I mean, I do like that they had to, they really had to sort of study it and think about how to deal with it, so it was a bit unfortunate that the way to deal with it was just to leave an antimatter bomb at the center of it and then just leg it. So do they have antimaterial? Antimatter. Oh. Yeah, yes they do. Do uh, they just carry it around? Yeah, yes they do. I mean I think their ship runs on it or something. I mean okay. uh, I, I'm isn't that a little bit dangerous? Extremely. Oh. <laughs> uh, and I mean after all the build up, the very slow and long build up I mean, I think the episode really just ended very suddenly. It was just, okay, antimatter planted, now we've got one minute. Oh, there's Spock, track the beam, everyone's safe, hooray, it blew up. It just happens in like two minutes. Just turn your back on getting a sandwich and mm, yeah. suddenly they are cured and saved I mean, and satisfied, I guess. So let's say the pacing was a bit off, maybe. A bit. Yeah. But Kirk only... Needed seven minutes. Yeah, I mean, what man doesn't need more to <laughs> penetrate the membrane? Okay, I've I've run that joke into the ground. Let's stop there. So uh, <laughs> yeah, but hmm? watching memes from this episode was funnier. Oh ah, yeah, the nodding meme. That was. I mean, it's always <laughs> funny when there's a meme that you've seen hundreds and hundreds of times, and then you actually see it, and you're like <laughs> pointing at the TV, like and Leonardo DiCaprio. Understand. <laughs> yes, I had. To. I mean, we had a lot more fun looking at Star Trek memes and GIFs after the episode than the episode itself. So I guess that says it all. So yeah. Uh, okay. Well, ne- I, until next week, then I guess. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Yes, exploring the memes. <laughs> that nodding stuff. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. And and there is lots of penetration. Wow, yeah, I think this episode title might yet be Space Hole Penetration. Yep. <laughs> and what do you do? Your returns are back to make a sandwich and 400 Vulcans have died. Yes, <laughs> I understand that the planet Vulcan has petitioned for Yona not to make any more sandwiches. <laughs> it's too disastrous. <laughs> but you're right, it, it, there's a... It's not just that 400 Vulcans died. A whole galaxy did, but never mind that. Well, maybe it was uninhabited. There are plenty of galaxies that are... Oh, no, they said millions had died. Oh, piss. Oh, well, never mind. (laughs) (laughs) And you're right, it really isn't a very good speech, is it? Our our orders are not to stay alive. Yes, it's to die. All right, okay, that's fun then. Uh, but yes, the the ship does run on antimatter. Um, that's quite a, a big bit. I mean, I suppose it, it talk, they talk a bit more about it next generation, don't they? But yeah, and there are various uh, scientific mon- mumbo jumbo things to explain how that's possible without them blowing themselves up. But there we go. But it is indeed disappointing that the episode, second episode in a row, a, a alien being is blow just blown up again. It just that just doesn't feel Star Trek somehow. But never mind. I don't think they generally do that in Next Generation. No, so, but then that's partly, that's deliberate, isn't yeah. it? Picard is supposed to be more about diplomacy than blowing shit up. Yeah. Right, uh, let us hear what Lama God made of this one. Lama God's look, Scotty, Fixie Tree, Jake, Ark. I felt a great disturbance in the force as if a million voices cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. Now, this is a very important episode which shines a light on a very important cultural milestone and that is, this finally reveals to me where that Kirk and McCoy nodding meme comes from. I've been wondering about that for bloody ages and I've finally discovered it. And that's it, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's all my thoughts on this one. No, okay, I'll maybe we'll cover more than that. So this is pretty much a bottle episode then with a with a tense race against the clock kind of plot as the crew try and save themselves from their own pretty much certain deaths. And the key things to this sort of episode these sort of bottle episodes where they're not using a lot of exterior shots, there's not much in the way of special effects, it's all about the 
performance is and the tension that the director can get out of it and this one doesn't really quite have the right level unfortunately as with a lot of things it could well be an artifact of the age that this episode was made for it certainly felt like it could have done with being 15 minutes shorter to really get the tension going in there it just didn't quite work for me instead you just get a lot of scenes with people seeming a bit annoyed about stuff for reasons that become annoying in themselves that said there is some good stuff in here there's definitely some great stuff with Spock I like Spock's confusion throughout this episode the absence of logic trying to deal with facts where there aren't any that match up with any observable or known phenomena and the conclusion he slowly comes to about himself and the Vulcan people and why they may do better here yeah that's all really good stuff and there's some good stuff from McCoy as well especially the fact that as he's trying to take care of the whole ship and especially the bit where he wants to actually pilot the shuttle out at the end himself because he actually wants to do a science he wants to do it properly and he kind of objects to Spock going in for once it's not just about their sparring and the trying that one up and ship it's because he really wants to do the science himself and that's something that's really nice to see from some of the other characters because you know McCoy is just the doctor you forget that he's actually a member of Starfleet he's actually there for the exploration side of things so to actually see him want to experience this new life form is something quite different but it's a really good thing to see in as I say as a Starfleet officer I like that which isn't to say of course we don't get some great scenes between Spock and McCoy anyway especially bits where they're trying to outdo each other in the shuttle although when they're trying to decide who should go Joe did comment with why didn't we just go fuck off and die save us all some time so that was uh, not necessarily having the right effect on all the viewers but the little comment that Spock gives about the fact that maybe we could have prevented wars if we'd all just had a little bit more empathy you know the fact that the death of one is a tragedy the death of millions is just a statistic sadly very relevant as I recall this yeah we're going to avoid a lot that was a very pithy comment from him and one of those perfectly Star Trek moments which illuminate aspects of the human race by having them been being seen from the outsider so yeah it's a shame that no one's really learned from that in the intervening years probably one of the bigger weaknesses of the episode is the fact that Kirk is just a dick in this episode really true the crew are struggling against this life and energy sapping force and yeah Kirk's desperate to save the ship and his crew from meeting the same fate as those in the Intrepid but at the same time he just comes across as a dick being short with Spock and pretty much everyone he's very unsympathetic in this episode and I don't like him a lot in this one to be honest so yeah that's probably one of the ways where it comes across as being unsuccessful when tension becomes just being a dick then yeah that's one of the areas where the story fails and probably the biggest problem with this episode which is unfortunate the central concept behind the episode there is a really good solid science fiction one a life form that is just anti-energy which is sucking up energy from around it it's not even a malevolent force it's just doing what it does because that's what it is it's a life form and this is the kind of concept that some more modern series would potentially eke out over many many episodes or maybe even seasons and here it's just one episode and done which is really nice to see in kind of retrospect and it is as I say a great concept the fact that the crew has to battle this while suffering from this thing that is the antithesis of everything in this universe that causes them to lose the will to live yeah that's a good solid concept and the idea that maybe maybe the only reason that life exists in this galaxy is to be antibodies against this kind of incursion of literally foreign life forms is a really powerful strong one which is actually what I'd like to see more rumination of in the episode itself rather than just being glossed over so that one of them will do heroics in the shuttle and save the day so yeah it's a good central solid science fiction concept something to think about really like that one obviously there is the big question of what is the intrepid what was it doing and to be honest I'm not going to go into that very much here because I'm sure there have been plenty of supplementary media items that have tried to answer the question of why if Spock is the first Vulcan in Starfleet then there's a whole crew of Vulcans on a Federation starship do they not have their own Starfleet yeah it's just it just wasn't established at this point was it so that's what you can say about that really canon can go and fix itself later and I'm sure we dealt with it anyway so I would probably go into it and what I did think about when they were flying inside this giant almost fluid amoeba is that yes you don't get the same kind of visuals but it does kind of make the opening of Star Trek Into Darkness where the Enterprise is underwater it seem a little bit tame really a bit, they're actually flying inside a wobbly jelly like amoeba here yeah not something dramatic and interesting that's how you do it Mr. Abrams that's how you do it so yeah an episode that wasn't bad really but could have been a lot better a bit more tense and a bit less of a curbing and dick would have done but then again I don't think I should really complain about an episode that gives us the line the area of penetration will no doubt be sensitive what else can you say to that so as ever I'm really looking forward to finding out how sensitive everyone else is I hope the most of you manage to keep your heads above water possibly quite literally at the moment and until next time glory to you and your cast Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it is slightly padded, which is possibly why we, we're not you know, rate, ran, ranking it as a great classic. Yeah. But, yeah, it's generally good. And as he says, a good concept. Yeah. And they're being drained by this sort of anti, not anti-matter, but anti-life you know, anti energy. Life, yeah. 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 And yeah, that's the point. If Spock's the first Vulcan in Starfleet, why is there a whole... Oh, clearly a lot more suddenly joined up when they heard he had. <laughs> so that's the only explanation, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> enough to form an entire ship wow <laughs> I mean I like it as a concept but you're right it does seem to have happened quite quickly doesn't it yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it works well in Deep Space Nine obviously because yeah. you get that wonderful thing with Cisco squaring off against the captain and well, the baseball the sh- yeah no the baseball isn't wonderful <laughs> 
I can't remember if I enjoyed that or not. No, no uh, we ha- well, you didn't at the time, and I certainly bloody hated uh, it. All right. <laughs> Maybe we got pulled off by the baseball then. Oh, badder, 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 badder. It's just like, yeah, it died out for a reason. So... I like the Futurama version, Blurnsball. Blurnsball, yes. I'm sure we, we probably mentioned that as well. Yeah. Wow, so long ago. <laughs> what about Drew and Tracy? So that was the immunity syndrome. Yes, it was. And what do we think of that one then? Yes, yeah, all right, actually. I, I didn't mind it at all. You're not going in with a classic straight away? Mm. I'm not too sure. I'm not okay. sure. Let's have a discussion and make a decision at the end. So let's start. So it starts off quite like depressing. Like the whole a massive, episode. Yeah, the whole thing is yeah. down. It's a downer episode. So there's a massive like thing going on and the intrepid... Gets blowed up. 400 Vulcans. 400 Vulcans just it's, like It's die. interesting, isn't it? Intrepid is only uh, manned or personed by Vulcans. That's going to be a fun ship at Christmas, wasn't it? Oh, fucking hell, any time, yeah. <laughs> Dear me. Yeah. But Spock is getting like the Vulcan sense, yeah. isn't he? He does, yes. Like, he's got his spider sense going on. He's getting the Vulcan sense. So mm-hmm. He knows what's happening before they actually kind of like get confirmation yeah. from Starfleet that that's happened. He does. So yeah, who was Mrs. Yellow Dress on the bridge? There's lots of lots of uh, women crew members in this. Lots, yeah, I mean, far yeah. Far outnumbered the far outnumbered the men. We've like, never all seen in before. the um, in the medical bay. And, and like, like in the yeah. red room when like Spock was um, yeah. when Kirky was giving his like his orders, there was like mm. three people. We were like, mm. who are you? You and you. Yep, never definitely. Seen you yeah. before. There was an there was an early forty seven minutes going on, wasn't there? Like Star Trek Next Generation and Deep Space Nine and Voyager always use 47. This is an early 47 minutes going there. But yeah, there was a contradiction in time though because Scotty was saying yeah, I know, you've got yeah, 47 work, minutes yeah, but yeah. then Spock was saying oh, it's yep. an hour or something and mm. oh, it was just a bit strange. The wooden controls in the shuttle when Spock was in the control that in the shuttle. looked like it, a knife wooden. block to me, <laughs> it did. didn't it? I wonder if they'd used that. It was like three knives, wooden handled knives, maybe. <laughs> maybe. I couldn't quite understand why they were all sweating, apart from Spock in this yeah, episode. it's not being drained of energy, maybe, but I don't know. Is it because, like, they were losing power and the environmental controls weren't working and stuff like that? But even know. when they were all on uh, the Enterprise, you know, most of them, like Kirk and McCoy and Ahura, were sweating, but yeah. Spock wasn't. They're weird as a Vulcan, aren't they? Yeah, but that just was weird. Mm. Kirk did a Simon Cowell, didn't he, <laughs> to, to uh, McCoy and Spock. He said, I'm sorry, but you're not going, you're not not going through. And he did a Simon Cowell, he said, I'm sorry, Mr. Spock. And like McCoy's smiling, but it's you that's going through. Yay! Yay! I, was, I don't know when the Venn diagram of X Factor watches and Star Trek <laughs> TOS watches is. But that's what Simon Cowan always does. He yeah. always pretends Indeed. that he's not putting them through and then puts them through. And that's what Kirk did, didn't they? You're literally giving too much air time I to know, Simon Cowan here. Am. Let it go. So Kirk was really fucking annoyed that he wasn't getting like some shore leave and stuff like yes, that. Yes, yeah. But surely there is kind of like a rule, and I know there was they were saying oh it's an emergency. But if a crew's been out for such a long time, and obviously they've not had any downtime and no shore leave and stuff like that, there's got to be a risk in saying, "Well, sorry, mate." Yeah, but it was an emergency. Yeah, but These still, could have taken over the galaxy. Sorry, mates, but you know you sorry. might be knackered and you can't keep your eyeballs. We need a trip to Rise. Eh? You're gonna have to just let all the amoeba things take over the galaxy. But they didn't mention Rise, did they? No, they didn't. The meme come from this. The McCoy nod and the Kirk nod comes from this episode. You must have seen it. No. The meme. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a meme. Bones. We're dying, Jim. We're dying, Jim. <laughs> so it's all over dramatic. dramatic. And they're being pulled into the zone of darkness. Yes, the zone of darkness. The zone of darkness. This was just really science heavy for me. You know what? It's for an early episode. It's really techno babble oh. heavy. Yeah, there's yeah. going about like protoplasm and chromosomes and membranes, nucleus. I wonder what the people in the sixties were watching this and like going, "What is it about?" Because I mean, that's all probably terms we know now. All but right. it's really techno babble heavy for They're a sixties. Like, oh what? Yeah, exactly. So this what I'm saying. I. Maybe it's a classic. I I enjoyed it. I very much enjoyed it. But I don't know. 
It's not got like the classic factor to it. Yeah, it was just too like much for me. I was a little bit like I can understand. I tuned that. off halfway through. Yep. But anyway, shall we leave it there? Okay. See you later, guys. Bye. 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 You're kind of assuming that Vulcans celebrate Christmas. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not massively likely, is it? No. <laughs> no. I have no idea who Mrs. Yellow Dress is, have you? Uh, I don't know her name, no. But, I mean, it was noticeable there were a lot more female crew members than usual. Which yeah. This is true. Yeah. No bad thing. Ooh. Although, it was unfortunate one of them in the sick page has got such a view of her pants. It's like, oh, can they not do it? Make the skirt a bit longer, surely. But never mind. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Um, in terms of, of shore leave, hello, Andy. Are there rules about if a crew is too tired and that's why they need shore leave rather than just, you know, they could do with it? Mm. Does it all get cancelled and then you end up presumably with overtired, exhausted crew? Or how does it work in a... Because as Drew says, this is an emergency. So how, how does that work, Tar? <laughs> And yes, it is science heavy. We we're used to a lot of those words now. But how many would they have known in the sixties? I don't know. Um, yeah. Well, again, this is kind of what you expect from Trek, sort of this high concept sci-fi stuff. And it's not a lot of mumbo jumbo for the no. most part, is it? I mean, you know, so antimatter is a thing, and we got used to that, and the idea of them being uh, like antibodies and stuff. Yeah, that's that's kind of you know legit, isn't it? Yeah, I just, I honestly don't know how many of those words, though, that they would have known back then. Mm, I don't know. He seems to agree with us that it's not bad. Yeah, it's not, it, it's not it's, on the classic It's not run. the classic yes, I think most people have said that, yeah. yeah. Well, let's find out what uh, Potty Man thinks. Hello, Orgs. Parry here to talk about the immunity syndrome. Um, now, talking from the inside of my shed just for a change of scenery. Um, now... This episode, I see what you mean. Um, I probably think this is why they changed up the view, the broadcast order for production, because plot beats-wise, or at least the basic outline, is very similar to Obsession. Um, it's almost like two different writers were given a basic plot outline of there's some sort of big creature which kills everything, and it's about to duplicate, and the crew have to go and kill it. I mean, they even kill it with the same thing, antimatter. Um... And so it's uh, is you know it's you can see the similarities, but it's also the way two writers approached it differently. It's an obsession. It's Kirk's. Uh, it's a kind of nemesis of Kirk, something that killed many of his crew previously and his captain. Whereas in this one, it's a giant freaking space amoeba. I know. I know. Um, a lot of people go oh, bloody hell, it's the giant space amoeba, but I like it for the weirdness. Um, again, I know I go on about in TOS space was dangerous, but this is it. You're like several billion people on a planet and a crew load of Vulcans. You know, I mean that's how we find out about it. Scott feels Spock, Spock feels a disturbance in the force, um, and realizes that a shipload of Vulcans has died. Um, so that sort of thing is just you know I, I do still like that space is dangerous and like I say just weird shit like this can happen. Um, and it's quite a, you know, I like the idea that because it's making the whole crew tired. Um, that everyone's a bit on edge, and that's why people are, um, are you know, sort of reacting so strangely, uh, you know, and why people are snapping at each other because this thing's slowly draining them. Uh, there's some lovely Spock and McCoy moments as well, like the the bit where they're both kind of volunteering to go on the suicide mission is quite something, and even the kind of back and forth thing they have over kind of the broken channels is good. And for all that, I mean, when you think about the episode, not much happens. It's basically them going around going we keep getting pulled towards it our sister you know scott is just saying yep yeah, the batteries are at 45 percent use basically that wee bit at the top of your phone and uh you know that's really you know in spock basically going around going i don't have enough information um you know that's that's basically it um and you know so in that way probably obsession on paper at least is the better episode because it's got a lot more character work crews this is just our crew solving a problem and it's very much a bottle episode entire thing happens on board the ship you know there are no new sets in this uh if it wasn't for the big glowy space amoeba which i still like as a visual it's hokey and it's stupid but i just it's got something to it. it's got that trippy 60s sci-fi feel to it which I, I really enjoy and yeah i mean ultimately you know the plot is basically they blow it up um, damn them, you know, <laughs> that's that's it and they happen to rescue Spock as well um, you know, in the, in the escape and they do manage to generate quite a lot of tension so, I mean, overall, like I say, I think Obsession's the better character piece and the one 
arguably better written, but I think I actually have a lot more fun with the immunity syndrome. If I'm going to watch a story about a big mysterious creature that kills thousands of people in one go and is about to breed so must be destroyed, um, I'd rather go with Space Amoeba than Dust Cloud, but that is just me. Um, I mean, I don't really even have many gripes, aside from <laughs> I'm really missing Sulu. It's, I, I was almost thinking we should bring back Who's at the Con, or Who's at the Con, um, to see which person's replacing Sulu in this episode. Um, but but yeah, it's, you know, I briefly thought Scotty wasn't going to be in it as well, because there was another bod at engineering, but I was quite pleased when Kirk called down. It turns out no, Scotty was in the engine room, and he had his understudy, I don't know, sitting up at the engineering table, so... That was at least quite fortunate, but yeah, I mean, overall I think this is just a solid little pulpy lump of sci-fi. It's never going to win any awards, uh, maybe it got something for like a special effect back in the day, but uh, but overall I find it really entertaining. So all that remains to say is do keep up the good work, I always look forward to the podcast and hope to feed back to the next one, but until then, bye for now. Hi sir! Hi! Solid little pulpy lump of sci-fi, I think, yeah. That, yeah, fair dues, yeah. fair dues. Yeah. But what are you drilling in the pie shed? That's what I want to know. <laughs> I want a pie shed. Where's my pie shed? Yes, there's plans for a pie shed underway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, weird but iconic is also a nice description of it as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, like you, I like the fact that space is dangerous, and the whole crew is tired as a result of mm-hmm. all the stuff. That's I like those more realistic aspects because I don't think. Yeah, compared compared to Enterprise D, where they you know yeah. they could just chill out and go to a bar or go to a holodeck and, you know, relive adventures and stuff. And it's like the entire bridge just looks like it's equipped with sofas. You know, this is this is tough business being, yeah. you know, uh, the, the cutting edge of stuff. So, yeah. Uh, interestingly, he predicted the return of our j- jingle on Who's yeah. the Khan, uh, which is nice. But, yeah, the, the fact that, that I would definitely prefer this to Obsession, and in part that's because there's giant space amoeba that is far more iconic than... <laughs> Gas cloud, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, interestingly, the the old Star Trek compendium, which yeah, before the days of the internet, kids, uh, when we wanted to find out about the plots of old Star Trek episodes, we had to buy books, physical books, and they told you about what happened in the episodes, and uh, each one had a picture, a grainy black and white picture, because it was you know cheaper, and and this one was the giant space amoeba with the Enterprise flying towards it. So whenever I think of the immunity syndrome, that's that's what I think of. But I guess it's unfortunate that Scotty is a little more on the battery level indicator of this, isn't it? But never yeah. mind. Yes. He's, 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 it's a few smiley moments, but yeah, there's not much more to him than that. No. But I think it's one of those things where there are some writers who struggle to to write well for more than a couple of characters. Hmm. And I think that's probably what we see. And let's face it, he gets more to do than Uhura, sadly, yeah. as per usual. I mean, Michelle Nichols is notably acting her socks off in the background all the time. Looking really tired and and uh, yeah, but ultimately she she doesn't get much to do. Sadly, I think the only thing I would say is I like the fact with her character they don't make it that oh because she's a woman she she collapses. And yeah, it's a bloke that collapses out. on the bridge. It's a bloke that collapses, yeah, that's good. and also she says no, it's all right, Captain, I can cope. She's not one of the ones that that goes under, and I do like that that mm. she's she has she feels awful, but she's got that level of strength. Yeah. Cool. Well, will the next one be uh, a classic or toss? We shall find out on the 26th of October when we cover a piece of the action. Now, that's an episode title that I remember. Uh Aha. But do I remember what it's about? No. Gangsters? Oh, that one. Yes, okay. I'll leave you with that one. (laughs) Let's see if that stands up or not. Until then, take care. Cheerio, bye. Bye, bye. The Star Trek theme was written by Alexander Courage. And here was arranged and performed by Drew Barker. The artwork was created by Andy Pelastides. All music referenced is for illustrative purposes only and no copyright infringement is intended. Find our website at broadcast.libsyn.com And we have a YouTube channel as well. Send emails or mp3s to broadcast at gmail.com Or you can find us over on Mastodon. Our addresses are on the show notes for this podcast. Shut it down!